Good evening, Bumblebee folks. I'm Alexa, resident emo girly. And as a gal who often refers to herself as ADHD Barbie because of my work experience, I feel pretty dang qualified to talk about crazy jobs today. So question for you, what's the worst or most dangerous job you've ever worked? For me, I think the worst was a retail gig I had once upon a time, and the most dangerous is working in live entertainment. Easy. But let me know your answer in the comments, and welcome to the top 10 most dangerous jobs in history you're glad you missed. Number 10, snake milker. So this job extracts venom from snakes for medical or research purposes, or in earlier times for war. While it still kind of exists today, it's not like how it used to be. They handle some of the most deadly snakes on earth. So for in modern times, you know, milkers use the extracted venom to create anti-venom antidotes. But during ancient civilization, they used to use venom to soak swords or arrows for use as biological warfare. How, um, resourceful, I suppose? Number nine, bring out the dead. So when the Black Plague knocked out roughly half a year up in the 14th century, bodies littered the streets. The job of plague body collectors was invented, which required the worker to collect bodies using only a cart, a rag to cover their faces, and flowers which were believed to prevent collectors from contracting the disease. You know, good old ring around the rosy. As much as there's not a lot to say about this job, since it's pretty straightforward, the risks were high, and many folks passed from disease just trying to make a living. Number eight, powder monkey. If you thought being a chimney sweep was brutal on young people, wait till you hear what they had to do during seaborne warfare during the Age of Sail. From the 16th century onwards, young people served as powder monkeys on sailing vessels all around the world. Boys as young as, um, years old, were tasked with carrying live explosives and ferrying explosive powder all over naval ships and merchant boats. Most of these boys had been orphaned somewhere in their early life. Naval vessels needed small people to move explosive rounds and other war-related materials around tiny holes throughout the ships, and the gig was deadly simply by the nature of the job requirements, so adults were wise to avoid it at all costs. Just get a little one to do it. Also, most adult men were simply too big for tiny ship holes, so the ship captains turned to the young folks for the awful role. During the battle, these boys would run up and down into the ship's hold to grab sacks of explosive powder. They would scurry back up to the deck to hand deliver the powder to the cannon crew, then they'd go run back down to make another, you know, like run for explosives. As you might expect, being in such close quarters to explosives while cannons are going off all around you isn't exactly a good spot to be in. But these people had no other recourse and no land going future waiting for them back home. So they died in anonymity and in great numbers, undoubtedly far greater than we may ever know considering their low status. Speaking of low status, these young people were amazingly used by ship crews even into the early 20th century. During the Civil War, for example, Union and Confederate ships both employed young folks to help their battle effort. These boys were typically the lowest status crewmen on board. Most were paid less than $6 a month for their unsung and extremely deadly efforts, and many perished in ocean battles and unpredictable explosions throughout the duration of the civil conflict. Number seven, food tasters. So, back in the day, many kings, queens, and emperors hired food tasters whose sole job was to make sure the royal's food wasn't poisoned. Although tasters risked their lives by eating possibly poisoned food, they also got to enjoy some of the most delicious and expensive food that members of the royal family ate. It's kind of a trade-off, you know, yummy food, but at the same time, you're at risk no matter what. Hopefully your food wasn't poisoned. Number six, ancient Rome chariot racers. So these were among the most popular and celebrated members of society back in ancient Rome. They were the celebrities, competing in coliseums. They drew a large fan base because of their high-speed racing and aggressive styles. But here's the thing, reins were tied around their wrists, so if they were overturned, game over for you. And hey, as time went on, their sidekicks were also subject to certain death. So for modern context, you know the people who remove and replace tires on Formula 1 cars faster than most of us can even drive? Well, an arming squire was basically the medieval equivalent of that. Their job involved maintaining, fixing, and applying a knight's armor, sometimes mid-battle. And no, they weren't wearing any armor themselves as they were rushing in. To add insult to injury, they also had to remove the spilled redness, sweat, mud, and goodness knows what else from the armor after a fight. And of course, uh, what did they use to clean with? Aged urine. No thanks. Number five, a trench runner. So as bad as the Second World War was from a pure fatality standpoint, World War I was kind of worse. The Great War, as it was known at the time, saw millions of horrendous casualties as new technologies swept across the battlefield. From noxious gases being used pretty liberally to fighter pilots diving high overhead during, you know, 
what they were doing, soldiers on all sides of the Great War experienced terrible ways to perish, and perhaps the worst of those manners was working as a runner. They were used to send signals and messages from trench to trench, and battalion to battalion during the war. Wireless communication technology was very much a theory more than a practical application at the time, and what little wireless ability there was often faltered at the slightest weather problem or technical issue. No, still kind of the same today. So, young soldiers were tasked to become runners when messages needed to get out there. Those men were almost always very low-ranking, non-commissioned officer, and they all had just one trait in common. They had to be physically fit. Hey, it's in their job title after all. So when a battalion needed to get a message out, they would task the runner with sprinting up and out of the trench and going into the open plain. There, they would have to run like hell to whichever other trench needed to hear their fellow soldiers' plans. These messengers were forced to pop up over the relative safely of the trenches and come under immediate fire from the other side. The phrase, don't kill the messenger, far predates this time period, of course, but it's not like soldiers followed its suggestion anyways. When runners popped up to deliver messages to other areas, they were kind of, bingo, target. Soldiers frustrated by the drudgery and terror of trench warfare use these runners as target practice. Artillery shells and incendiary devices far beyond what was necessary to kill, you know, just one soldier were aimed at these poor men. And for many men buried deep down the trenches, a runner's presence might be the only action they saw for days. So they cherish the opportunity to uh, get an easy kill. With a runner, a World War I vet commented years later, it was merely a question of how long they would last before it was the end of their life, which is pretty grim. Number four, a Greek fire operator. So this was basically an ancient flamethrower. It was used during the Byzantine Empire during its wars and conquests as early as the fifth century. Historians know now that it was very infamously used several times to save Constantinople from invasions. And most notably, Greek fire was employed as a vicious flame tossing defense against, you know, yeah, those forces. Now, accounts for the time claim Greek fire was a flame technology spurred on by piping in water. So only other substances like urine, sand, or vinegar were able to douse the flames. As centuries old accounts claim, Greek fire operators were ordered to fire the water-based liquid through bronze tubes at a target. Now, these tubes were usually on ships, but some battles employ their use on land as well. The liquid had been preheated and pressurized, so when it was, you know, Sent out of the tubes, it sometimes went nearly 100 feet. Through the pressurization, it would catch fire as it was, you know, released, and it would send out a volley of fatal flames. Of course, it wasn't just, you know, this empire's enemies who would have suffered at the hands of the fire. The primitive technologies of the time would have undoubtedly ensured the men operating the device were constantly, and excuse the pun, going down in flames as well. Statistics for that type of fiery death are impossible to determine today, of course, but we know based on historians' interpretations of ancient texts that Greek fire was a feared battle tactic all throughout the region. We also know that ships on which it was employed often got fired themselves amid the chaos of war. In that sense, this empire's greatest weapon of war also proved to be one of its most terribly deadly manners of self-inflicting wounds. Amazingly, historians aren't entirely sure how to recreate Greek fire today. The weapon has been documented and was noted quite a bit in historical tracts written during and after the uh, empire's run, but aside from general explanations of the fire technology, specific instructions have never been found. It hasn't been used much in other recent history by other empires either, so today historians wonder whether the now lost secret of Greek fire was simply discarded because it proved far too deadly to those in charge of, you know, weapons. Number three, a lime burner. So lime mortar has been a crucial building material since around the first century BC, but it takes a lot to turn its chalky origins into the cement-like finished product. Workers were needed to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium-rich stone, which is where the lime burners stepped in. Their job involved heating limestone in a kiln at around mm, 800 degrees Celsius, exposing themselves to harmful carbon monoxide and suffocating chalk dust. And hey, if that wasn't enough, the finished product was prone to um, kabooming when it came into contact with water. So have fun with that. Number two, petard ears. So if you haven't heard of this profession yet, it's probably because the position only existed during late medieval and early renaissance times, and also because most folks don't really uh, live to talk about their position. The job involves teams of around seven men placing petards, a rudimentary kind of explosive, as close to their enemy's defense line as possible during sieges. Think like fortress walls, tunnels, and more. Oh, and if they weren't already worried about enemy fire, the 100 pound petard itself was liable to go kaboom at pretty much any given time. Hence the phrase, hoisted by his own petard. And here I thought it was a euphemism for something. Pardon me, why? Number one, tin openers. Submarine technology was bad enough during the Second World War, as you know, we all kind of know, but a few decades earlier, we're going back to World War I, 
it was a far more rudimentary and thus even more deadly situation. So while there weren't as many men going down into the depths, and therefore not the same raw number of fatalities, at least one Great War Watergate proved truly terrible, and these men were known as the Tin Openers, and their job was to secure submarines from enemy interests after they were sunk deep down to the ocean bottom. Basically, both the Allies and the Germans had a ton of coded messages and cryptologic communications on board their submarines back in the day. So when a submarine was sunk by an opponent, the vessel's remnants became highly prized as they drifted down to the seafloor. Recognizing this, the British Royal Navy started employing teams of deep sea divers to raid sunken German U boats. The Navy's hope was that these men could come away with ciphers, codes, and keys to secret messages. And in turn, those ciphers could theoretically help the British intercept and translate other future German military messages. Which, hey, seems like a great idea, right? Why not go behind enemy lines and steal their submarine signals? Well, there's like one teeny tiny problem? The men tasked with diving down to get this intel died very, very often. For starters, most submarines were sunk in areas where there were active open ocean minefields. So many divers were just, you know, blown up in mine explosions long before reaching the seafloor. For the lucky few that did make it down to the sunken subs, most of those wasted vessels still had active torpedoes and other live ammunition rounds. Okay, explosives aside, the very active diving deep into the North Atlantic often to depths of hundreds of feet or greater, was its own terrible journey. Dive suit technology was not nearly as good as it is today, so oxygen pipes often faltered, and the unbearable pressure of the depths forced many men to succumb in gruesome and grisly ways. Being so far beneath the surface meant that small mistakes quickly festered, and there was no medic help down in those depths. Yeah, these folks had an important job, but it was awful. And that brings us to the end of our time, and you know what? Being occasionally punched on the job and lifelong rib damage sounds a lot less bad when compared with this historical context. If you enjoyed my ramblings today, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hit the bell for more dangerous content, and I'll see y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.